welcome to the Radiant Mission Podcast. My name is Rebecca Toomey, and I am here with my amazing co-host and sister, Rachel Smith. Hi. We are on a mission to encourage and inspire others as they're navigating through this life and with their relationship with Christ. And today we are continuing the conversation with the wonderful Sarah Napick, and she is an IBCLC certified lactation consultant or international board certified lactation consultant to be exact. You can find her at fortheloveoflactation.com or on Instagram at fortheloveoflactation underscore. And last week she joined us and we talked all about tongue ties, cheek ties, lip ties, all the ties, but we have more that we need to dive into when it comes to breastfeeding and nursing these babies. So we're going to jump into more of it. We had briefly scratched the surface of the difference between a lactation or talking about lactation consultants in the hospital. And to give a little bit more context, we had all had, all three of us had the same experience where we had lactation consultants come talk to us, consult with us when we were in the hospital, but they didn't necessarily help us. And none of them identified any of our children's tongue tie issues that Rachel and I learned later after the fact, years later, that our first children likely had tongue ties. I mean, I learned that. You you learned it last episode. episode. (laughs) (laughs) Seven years later, I learned when I took Ben for his appointment, when he was two days old for his first appointment, and he got assessed by our pediatrician who's very, he actually studies up on this stuff because he cares. And, uh, he was doing the assessment. I go, Brooke was with us and I go, Hey, can you look at her mouth? I think she might've had, he's like, yeah, she definitely has some time. And I'm like, ah, oh. so it was too little too late at that point. Cause she was already two and a half. He's like, there's not really much that we can do if, you know, she has trouble with anything, but she hasn't had any trouble with speech or, um, anything like that. So we'll see. But yeah, so we were talking about all that. And I really wanted to ask Sarah what the difference is between a lactation consult when you're in the hospital and then someone like you who is out working outside of the hospital setting. What's the big difference between what you guys are doing? Okay. So there's there's a huge difference. And I feel like it's, it's something that's not talked about because you just hear the word lactation consultant be thrown around. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you right now that anybody can call themselves a lactation consultant if they want to. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Anybody can. Um, But the ones that are in the hospital, there are some IBCLCs that hospitals will contract at hospitals, but that's not always the case. Sometimes they are what is called CLCs, which are certified lactation consultants, Interesting. which is different than the international board certified okay. <laughs> consultant. So there's two different, um, you know, acronyms that are used for these two different types of lactation consultants. Um, The CLCs is something that can be done pretty quickly where you take, it's pretty much like a week long online course. I think it's 45 hours and you take that course and take a little multiple choice quiz and then boom, you're a CLC. (laughs) And that is- Wow. I could get that done this weekend. (laughs) (laughs) So that is- really all there is to that. And then you can call yourself a lactation consultant. And so sometimes we're seeing ones like that at the hospital that have just kind of done this basic course. They haven't really dove into all of the coursework that's involved in becoming an IBCLC or gained that clinical experience since it's not a prerequisite for it. Mm -hmm. Um, Neither are some of the health science courses that are required Mm -hmm. as an IBCLC. So with being an IBCLC, there are three different pathways that you can take to become one. The first pathway, you have to be um, in one of these medical fields. And there's like a list of probably, I think, up to 14 different um, fields that qualify 
for pathway one. I know like one of them, for example, is like a nurse. And so if you decide to do pathway one, you have to do the 95 hours of lactation specific education. So it's already more than double what the CLCs had. And on top of that, you have to have a thousand supervised hours of um, clinical care for lactation. Oh <laughs> so tons and tons. That must of- take forever since they only come in for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so this, yeah, a lot of times it'll take people who do pathway one around five years wow. to accomplish because they're accomplishing it while they're working their job as a nurse. So let's say it's like a nurse who's working at a pediatrician's office and is shadowing an IBCLC. They're, they're gaining clinical hours through that. So it takes them years of just doing their job and doing Mm -hmm. these hours to even be able to sit for the board exam afterwards. Um, then there's pathway two, which is what I did, which I highly recommend. It was, it was fabulous. Um, you do not have to have a health science background, but you do have to have taken a few like health prere- prerequisites, which I just easily took online. And then I did, um, you kind of start with a little like a CLC course and that's kind of like your beginning prep then then once you um, finish that course then you start the 95 hours of lactation specific education and then you do 300 hours of clinical experience um, through an accredited university who is specific for lactation. There are not many in the United States that do that have a lactation program. Um, I did mine through UCSD, so um, San Diego, and everything was done via Zoom in the start of the pandemic, which typically they partner with hospitals all around the US and you go in person to do your clinical hours. But I, I was able to do everything virtually. Um, They had an amazing program called Liquid Gold that actually had um, breast simulators and actors that would do um, real life situations that you may encounter in lactation, you know, when you're working as a lactation consultant. And these these realistic breast models could actually express milk. They could have... um, you know, any range of issues going on with them that you may encounter with breastfeeding. So we'd be able to identify, you know, thrush or whatever it may be mm. on this breast model. It was wild. Um, and That's pretty cool. I personally loved doing it virtually um, because we got to see everything mm. where if you are just if you're doing it in person, sometimes you're seeing like similar cases over and over and over, and you're getting just like really familiar with a specific scenario. Um, Mm -hmm. But I was able to really get into like complex cases um, with, with doing it virtually. And then, you know, they also gave us amazing resources for, um, you know, how to do oral assessments in person. Cause that was a big fear of mine too, is okay. I've done everything virtually. Mm-hmm. Now I'm a lactation consultant. I got to put my hands in a real baby's mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it is wild. Just how naturally it came. Like even just doing the trainings online, I feel like it, it really prepared me and made me feel confident going into this job in the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there is pathway three, which you do the same 95 hours of lactation education. And you also shadow an IBCLC. So you have to get 500 hours of shadowing one before you're able to sit for the exam. And I think that's a really fun option. And I was exploring that as well, because that would have been really great to get that hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. But with the start of COVID, when I was starting my journey, Mm. there was no IBCLC that was going to be doing anything in person anytime soon Mm. so it actually kind of worked out um because I like lactation consultants had to kind of start doing everything virtually for Mm. a while Mm -hmm. in COVID and so I feel like my training gave me the ability to know how to do virtual consults really really well that's awesome 
which has been helpful um, with, I'm able to see clients, they don't have to be local. They can be anywhere in the U S and mm-hmm. I know how to figure out everything I need to just via a zoom call. So um, yeah, those are the three different pathways. So it's really cool how, um, you know, there's multiple, like multiple multitude of different ways to become a lactation consultant and mm-hmm. how different it is from those hospital ones that may have just took a, a week long course. And then they call themselves a lactation consultant. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I love that you're able to do, or that you do do virtual consultations yes. because I'm the type of person that loves virtual type of things and would feel yep. a lot more comfortable with that type of environment. And I know mm-hmm. a lot of women probably feel that way too. Even if, even if it does end up being something where you do meet in person, maybe after the first consultation or the second or whatever, you know, it's very, I don't know if you guys feel this way. It was really awkward for me when these ladies came into the room when I was in the hospital and they like immediately grab your boob yep. without yep. saying anything to you first. And it's like, <laughs> and don't that- touch me. <laughs> That is not okay in any sense of it. Um, One of the biggest things we learned in our training is to always ask for permission to touch before you touch anybody. So they were just coming in, grabbing your boots, and they were not doing their job. I I can't even, I mean, I had a lot of problems with my whole thing. I mean, I got two episodes on my birth, so you know, I I got problems there, (laughs) but um. The the thing that, and I, I shared this with Sarah when we were talking one day that I thought was really f- fascinating and funny was I had a couple of different lactation consultants come through when I was in the hospital and my daughter, Brooke, the first, she liked to be in upright position, which is just her head is up here and she's more like up and down, um, more parallel to my body. And they acted like they've never seen this before. They were like, they like I was a have. circus freak. <laughs> This one lady, this one lactation consultant brought other people into the room (laughs) to show them. They're like, look at this. And they were trying to get me to change her position before this. They were like, oh, do like football, football holder, try this or try this. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. This is the most comfortable position for me and for her. I just intuitively knew like, this was what I would, this was what we're doing, me and her. Um, so it just, anyway, that It's just a total aside, but thank you for sharing that about the difference, because I think a lot of us can be turned off by the hospital. So it's awesome to know that there are are other options or for those of us that are home birthing. I mean, we're going to need somebody that's going to call us over zoom or come to our house. (laughs) Yeah. I might, I might be calling you Sarah for my third because Lord knows I needed it for the the last two. (laughs) Yes, Look in this you, baby's you, mouth with the camera. <laughs> I have all the tips and tricks to, to help you doing it all over like the computer and everything. So that's, I have ways. <laughs> that's great to know, especially because I mean, I do have great resources with my midwives, right. but like we talked about on the last episode, when you're home and you're in the thick yeah. of it and you're like, I need help right now. Yep. And you can't wait for an appointment with someone a week later when your nipples are bleeding. <laughs> exactly. exactly. You can't wait. It's urgent. It really right. is. So no. there, I, you know, whenever I see a client too, when they fill out like a booking form, I always have them click like the level of like emergency that mm. it is. So yeah. if it's like, this can wait a few days or this is emergent, I need to be seen like within 36 hours. So I really try and like, make it happen where I can see clients when they need to be seen because there it doesn't work the same way like when you call to make a physical and they're like oh I the closest I have is three months from now yeah. it's like no this, 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 my baby will be three months old by then yeah. no. <laughs> like, <it's> yeah. like, <laughs> absolutely definitely moms need to be seen right when they are needing help so anyways yeah. awesome <laughs> I'll let y'all get to the next one. I don't go. Yeah. Well, Rachel's ready. She's, she's going to be ready for you. I'm sure. Although I know that you're going through a different experience this time too, Ray. Rachel is, um, having a birth with a midwife, as she mentioned. So, you know, we talked last time about how sometimes C-sections can contribute to poor, what is, what is the right word? Poor outcomes for breastfeeding. The cascade of events leading to, yeah. 
so it can yeah. impact it. So we're all very anxiously excited, Rachel, about your breastfeeding journey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I know Lord, I am. I can't Lord, wait. <laughs> Lord willing. I don't know what to expect this time. So yeah, I, I mentioned last time that I made it exclusively breastfeeding, breastfeeding about eight months with my first. And then my second, he also wouldn't gain weight. I didn't have the pain that I have my first. I actually easily right. latched him. It seemed like everything was totally different and great but he lost like two pounds in the first week and didn't gain it back. And it was just like, it was like history repeating itself that my babies couldn't gain weight. And I actually like crying to the pediatrician at the six week appointment. She's like, you, I don't think you have enough fat in your milk. Oh, goodness. She admitted that there's something wrong with my milk. And I'm like, well, can we get it tested? And she's like, no, we don't really do that. I'm like, well, then how do we know? She's oh like, my gosh. Supplement with formula. And yeah. because of what I've been through the first time, I'm yeah. like, I'm not going through eight months of, of no second guessing. And so that time I just did both breastfeeding and formula. Right. I think I made it six months doing both with him, which is kind of the worst thing to do because breastfeeding alone is, I mean, it, it can be really easy when you get going. But then when you also have to make and clean bottles a lot, that's yeah. So I would love to have a better experience. And that kind of plays into one of the questions that Rebecca and I had yeah. for you is, is like, what's something that repeat moms might not know about breastfeeding that can be a game changer. And also if a mom is struggling to breastfeed with her first or multiple children, will she always struggle like mm-hmm. me? <laughs> <laughs> so every baby is different and every baby can present a different set of challenges. So it could be very difficult to breastfeed the first and then second baby is there's zero issues. It's really hard to say. Um, I, every baby is just, is just unique. Um, with my girls, you know, we talked in the other episode, how my oldest daughter, she had the stage four posterior tongue tie while my second daughter had an anterior tongue tie. So one that was super visible and easy to see, um, caused a whole bunch of different problems for me until we had it fixed, um, with cracked and bleeding nipples, things like that, that never happened with my first, just because of the tie placement. So every baby is really just so different. And so I always tell moms to just go into it with an open mind and kind of have your resources already picked out. So I always recommend prenatal appointments. I think that if I could get every new mom to have a prenatal appointment, that would be a dream because I feel like there's so much just prenatally that I can help help them prepare for and what to expect. So that way, when they do run into challenges, they feel empowered and know what steps to take next instead of kind of that feeling of like flailing, like, help me write this. I need help. Someone help me. Mm -hmm. And just kind of like not knowing what to do. And then, and then sobbing and breaking down because I've been there. I, I help moms all the time that are in that spot. And I think that is probably my, my biggest tip is Sarah, you mean a prenatal lactation appointment? Yes. Yes. Before you have your baby, yes, (laughs) get started on the lactation knowledge before yes. the baby's born like a one-on-one crash course in Beautiful. breastfeeding yeah what to expect if you have a pump how to set up your pump how mm-hmm. to um for me to measure your flange sizes because that's something that oh my god pumps- I didn't know yeah. about the flange size thing <laughs> yeah. until I had already been doing it for like a year and I saw yep. an Instagram video about it and I was like I've been doing this wrong this whole entire time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So that's something that prenatally I can help, um, get you size. So you're already set up for success before you have your baby. You, you know Mm -hmm. how to use your pump. You have the right flange size. That's already huge. Mm -hmm. Um, and just knowing, you know, different latch techniques beforehand, knowing signs of tongue tie, um, knowing the best bottles for latch, Mm. because there are some bottles that 
are, in my opinion, just poop. <laughs> and, then <there's, laughs> and then there's others that are really great for breastfeeding and helping promote that wide latch. Mm. So just kind of going over all of those tools. So that way, um, if there's, you know, there's a breastfeeding pillow I recommend or bottles I recommend them getting or new flange sizes, they can go ahead and like purchase those items and have them. So they're mm-hmm. like, all right, I have do it before tools. you do your registry. And then that way yes. you can put it on your registry. Exactly. Because I run into a, a lot where I feel bad because I'll have a consult and moms are, um, showing me their bottles and their boppy and things. And I'm like, I'm going to be recommending some other things. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and, you know, telling them like the benefits, if they, if they get these like other tools, I do recommend like over the ones that they got on their registry. And mm-hmm. typically they're, you know, they're receptive to it and are willing to explore and get the other items. Um, but it's just huge. Just to, to it sounds like you like- need to make a resource for this. If you don't already have have one, huh? Like yes. Sarah's top tips. Top for what to put on that, your registry? That just reminds me. Do you <laughs> like the breast friend pillow? Yes. Oh, it is. I love it. I'm, the that's, best. I I I have mine that's seven years old because I lived yeah. with that pillow on me. I could not nurse without it for either of my boys. The breast friend is an absolute game changer because it gives you back support. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, The boppy, I feel like everyone gets the boppy and it's great for older babies, but before babies have good head control, Mm. all it does is it sits too low and babies aren't aren't big enough. So you end up leaning forward and bringing Mm -hmm. yourself to the baby instead Mm -hmm. of bringing the baby to you. So the breast friend is literally a game changer. I bring one to every single (laughs) <laughs> um, home visit that I do. And I will probably like 75% of the time, if a mom does not have a breast friend pillow at home, they're ordering one on Amazon yeah. while I'm still there. <laughs> yes. You got to get a that's... sponsorship on that one, girl. <laughs> I know. Seriously. They commented yeah. on one of my things before and I was like fangirling. I'm like, you, I, I love your pillows. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love to hear that. Cause even though I didn't have the best experience, like I felt that same way about the boppy versus the breast yeah. friend. And I got rid of my boppy. I'm like, this is useless. Boppies yeah. make really good dog pillows. Yeah. <laughs> my dog loved it. And, uh, yeah. It's great for taking photos, but it's yeah. not a great nursing pillow for sure. It is not. Nope. <laughs> you know, I love what you said though, about how every baby is different because mm-hmm. this is the same mentality that I know Rachel and I have about birth too. Every birth yep. is different and you know, it's hard for us to, if, especially if you have a, a bad experience or poor experience with mm-hmm. your first or with your second to think like, oh, that's, this is going to go that way for me, but it's not. Every birth is new. Every birth is different. And every breastfeeding experience is going to be different too. Every baby is different. And that's why we're so excited to talk to you about a lot of these tips, because I know, you know, you've seen it all, you've seen it all and you've experienced it too, where you had a very challenging situation. And then with your second, you're still nursing her. And so you ended up having a good experience in the end with your daughter, but the beginning was tough. And uh, I just know a lot of people can relate to that. So we just want to encourage you if you're listening and you've had a poor breastfeeding or birth experience that the next time it doesn't have to be that way. Every birth and every experience is different, but you were talking about pumps. And so I want to know your, the, the DL on pumps, how do you feel about them? Do you have a recommendation for when they should be used? You know, should a mom establish her supply and do the whole breastfeeding thing for four to six weeks before introducing a pump? Or is it more like, you know, are you going back to work type of thing? Like walk us through some scenarios that you run into and all that about all the pumps. Yeah. So, um, kind of just basics about pumps. I'm sure that y'all have heard of like the wearable pumps and everything. Those are huge right now. Just the ones that are like the wireless ones, the wireless ones. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Like the LV, the willow, mm-hmm. those are really, really great pumps. And I, I recommend them for moms that are constantly on the go, but it should not be your primary pump. I always recommend having a pump that, you know, 
you plug into the wall and you mm-hmm. use at home. Cause they, um, they have better pressure and suction than the other do. ones do is what I've read. I, I didn't yeah. get a wearable because of all the reviews that people said it doesn't suck as much, or I don't know what the right word is. There's not enough <laughs> suction. <laughs> In those they're, stuck enough. <laughs> they're just not, they don't have as powerful of a motor. So mm-hmm. they're a little bit harder to align as well. So, you know, I've tried both and I found that, you know, with the LV, when I could get it lined up correctly, it's great. Mm-hmm. But there's times where it could be like a little bit off and then milk ends it up just like going all over my shirt. <laughs> and I was like, oh no. You're like, no. <laughs> so not the precious milk. <laughs> right. So it's kind of more um, like trial and error with those. Definitely not what I would recommend for like an mm-hmm. establishing supply or maintaining a supply pump. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, more one, if you have a good supply and you're just on the go, then yeah, you can use um, one of the wireless pumps and that would be totally fine. Okay. But if you're a mom that is struggling with low supply, trying to maintain supply, definitely um, one of those pumps that you keep at home like the Medellas are Mm -hmm. great the Spectras are great um the Modif Lunas are also really good those are probably like my top three pumps that I recommend okay um I have two of those three (laughs) yes (laughs) so they're just like the tried and true you know (laughs) those are those are really great ones um and then you know they all have different like settings for how to operate them. So really Mm -hmm. just making sure that you have someone show you, show you the ropes, especially Mm -hmm. the, um, the spectra can be a little tricky. There's a lot of numbers going on. So you got to know what you're working with, with the spectras. Um, but as far as when to start pumping, it really depends. Mm -hmm. I personally am not a huge fan of the wait until six weeks until your milk is established before pumping, Mm -hmm. because what if, we're having trouble breastfeeding, then we need to preserve our milk supply and keep it up. And Mm. we're not just going to put off pumping for six weeks because Mm -hmm. we're still establishing milk supply, you know, Mm -hmm. and working on breastfeeding. Like there are, there are tons and tons of scenarios where if a baby is not effectively latched for a feeding, we have got to effectively remove the milk somehow to signal Mm. our body to continue to produce the milk. Yeah. And that's when the pump is going to come into play. So if the baby is two days old and is struggling to latch and your, you know, your milk really even hasn't even come in yet, I'm still going to recommend pulling out that trusty pump and pumping every two to three hours if baby's not latching, Mm. um, just to stimulate your milk to, to come in to come into that mature milk and, um, to help your supply, because if you are not stimulating and removing every two to three hours in the beginning, then it's going to hinder milk supply. Mm -hmm. Um, and then making sure, like we said earlier, like the flanges are sized correctly can have a huge impact on how much you're able to pump as well. So making sure that they're sized correctly. So that's kind of my biggest advice when it comes to pumps is it's going to look very different for like everybody's journey on how breastfeeding is going. Um, but that's generally my rule of thumb. If you're going to pump to replace a nursing session, whether Mm -hmm. you're at work and need a pump or baby's still struggling and we're trying to figure out what's going on, why latching isn't working, we're going to pump to stimulate at that Mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. I went wild with the pump the first time I, uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she was latching fine and she was feeding fine, but I just got this idea that I was going to make a stash and yes. <laughs> that that was going to be helpful at some point in my life or in her life. I mean, cause obviously I'm not going to drink it, but, um, it, I actually ended up creating an oversupply for myself yeah. that then I had to kind of like continue for a period of time because it was painful if I didn't pump. So I would feed her and then I would pump after to pump out more. And then if she didn't wake during, you know, certain, as she was sleeping more at night, you know, I would wake up to pump. And then when she was six months old and I realized she would not take a bottle, by the way, she never took a bottle. (laughs) So she was never actually getting any of this milk. I'm like, I need to just stop doing this. And I was going on a trip to my visit my parents in Florida and I just stopped pumping. And then 
it, my, it, everything just adjusted. Yep. I stopped after a couple of days having the, you know, over full breasts and like all, you know, whatever, whatever was coming with that and things just adjusted and we continued on from there. So it was really interesting. I ended up with this huge stash that I ended up donating to That's a mom wonderful. who her baby was born at 24 weeks oh and my goodness. her supply, she just had a really hard time and she was looking yeah. for other moms in the area. And so I gave her like 200 ounces or whatever it was. And, um, he's, you know, three and a half now, which is awesome. Like I've still stayed connected with her and I was glad that it went somewhere. But so now fast forward, when Ben came, I didn't pump at all until actually it was your mother-in-law who was <laughs> going to babysit. And I'm like, I got to pump. And I had not pumped <laughs> at all. And I feel yep. like he was six months old, maybe seven months old. And I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> yes. And my, I think, I think my body just was, is not used to it. It took a couple of right. sessions to really get much out of, out of it. But I also was trying to use that spectra. And just like you said, if you don't know how to use them, <laughs> the settings were so weird. It's a learning curve. And I think that's another, um, another thing about pumps is I think it's taught to moms, especially with like insurance companies, they give you a free pump. It's mm -hmm. under the impression that every mom needs a pump to breastfeed. Mm. And if breastfeeding goes well, you don't need a pump at all. If you're not going back to work, um, like you were saying, you didn't pump for six months. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. don't necessarily need a pump. And I think our society has made it like every new mom has to have one, um, <laughs> yeah. which, <laughs> which yeah. they are wonderful tools. Like I, I don't want to discredit pumps at all because of they, course. And they, if you need they, it, you need it. They, you know? they save breastfeeding relationships. They did for my first daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, I feel like moms are kind of taught kind of like what you did with your first daughter that, Oh, I, sh I should be pumping and breastfeeding yeah. and then breastfeeding and pumping. I was <laughs> going crazy <laughs> and then create this oversupply, um, which I mean, is a whole other beast in itself. Mm -hmm. Um, having too much milk is, is still a problem of not having enough milk. So, <laughs> yeah, well, that leads to my question about hakas. Yes. And how do you have thoughts on the haka? And for those that don't know what I'm talking about, it's spelled H A A K A A. Do you like them? Do you love them? Do you hate them? Do you, how do you feel about the Hakka? <laughs> I have a love hate relationship with the Hakka. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I don't know why I had a feeling. <laughs> so I think they are great tools in the beginning as mm -hmm. your milk supply is being established and regulated. So for the first six weeks or so, your body is purely making milk based on hormones. After you deliver the placenta, your body sent that signal to start making milk. Your body doesn't know how many babies it's feeding for like mm. those first few weeks. It mm. is just making milk to make milk. And it's not until it switches from that hormonal control to that supply and demand where your body's able to regulate okay, I'm only feeding one baby. I know how much milk I need to make. So the Haka can be a really great tool in the beginning mm -hmm. to help catch the letdown when your milk is still regulating and you're just, you're sometimes making too much. Um, and you need just a way to catch that milk without pumping because then pumping is just going to stimulate your body to make more. And we don't want to do that. We just want to get rid of some of the excess letdown that's happening. Mm -hmm. And that can be the Haka is a wonderful, wonderful tool in doing that. Um, if they are overused, like past the point of the hormonal control of milk production, that's when they can sometimes cause problems because we don't want them to cause an oversupply at all. <laughs> because <laughs> if they if they get used too frequently past that point, then and your body's working off supply and demand, and you're still putting the haka on for every single feeding, then it's going to signal your body that you need to be producing that much yeah. milk. Yep. So your body's not going to get that regulating signal, if that makes sense. It makes sense to me. I'm laughing because yeah. that's exactly what happened. The haka was like <laughs> my gateway to them pumping and then to this oversupply thing. But I, I, 
I do think it helped my, me in the beginning, like you said, the first yeah. couple of weeks to really get my supply established. So for those that don't know what a haka is, it's basically a little silicone cup that you suck. It suctions onto Suction the up. other breast yep. while you're nursing on one side and it catches the letdown and then you switch sides and you can switch it. And, um, I think it can be a great tool, like you said in the beginning, for sure. And I did that with Ben, but then I weaned off of it and didn't yep. depend on it like I did with my first. So I, I think I always recommend hakas to moms just because I think it's good in the beginning, like you said. Oh, but for sure is. You got to yeah, be careful with way. it because yep. <laughs> if you feel yourself getting an oversupply and maybe you want to save milk, I don't know. Maybe yep. you're actually going to use it. I mean, <laughs> I've got some baths I got to use mine in for my kids, I guess. <laughs> so the, the risk of oversupply from pumping or hakas, neither of those ever affected me in that way. <laughs> Since my struggle was no matter how much I pumped or how long I kept that hawk on there, I was, I was never getting an oversupply. So for moms like me who struggle with having even enough to just feed the right. baby, what mm. are your favorite tips for increasing supply? Yeah. So really, if you're struggling with supply, my biggest tips are going to make sure that watch is good. Make sure that we're effectively removing milk because over time, if latch isn't effective, it's going to signal our body to produce less and less. Mm. And so it kind of creates this cascade of events in making a lower supply. Um, and moms won't understand why it's happening. I'm latching baby all the time, but if your baby's not being effective at the breast, then it's going to cause that cascade to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. So really just making sure the latch is good that we're doing that and then um, pumping in addition. So for moms with low supply, you know, power pumping can be really helpful. Yeah, I did that. Is, yeah, yeah, which is like pumping, you know, every 20 minutes for like an hour. So yeah. just really stimulating your body in overdrive um, or pumping directly after every single nursing session for 15 to 20 minutes, um, kind of, you know, trying to boost that supply as much as possible, just from frequent stimulation and milk removal. Those are going to be like the key things. There's not a magic tea, a magic cookie. I so wish there is. The pink yeah. drink from Starbucks is it's not going to just increase milk supply overnight. Uh, <laughs> they marketing will really, really get you with those. Um, I mean, I will like browse the aisles at Target and see all of the things out there, like the granola bars and this and that that are they have like um lactation like Cheez Its now. I don't know if y'all have seen <laughs> I've never heard of that. <laughs> They're at Target next time you're there. Um, <laughs> so they're, you know, just suckering the moms in, which I tried them and they're good. They taste like Cheez-Its, but it was very expensive Cheez-Its. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the thing with these. Some of them do taste good and they're yes. very expensive. What yeah. do you think of like brewer's yeast? Like I made up yeah. my own lactation cookie recipes, like using brewer's yeast and flaxseed and oatmeal yes. and... So those are really do anything. <laughs> those are the herbs that I recommend. Um, you can try like, you know, um, like you said, all those herbs you listed are really good. Um, and like there's go through that can be really good. And like the flaxseed, um, brewer's yeast. Um, and then gosh, now I'm like mind blanking on the fenugreek. fenugreek. Yes. yes. There we go. So fenugreek is hit or miss. There's moms that love it and swear by it and that it helps and in others that it diminishes their supply. Oh. So <laughs> it works um, for me, but I'm not a good example. <laughs> so it's never one that I recommend. Um, they, the company called legendary milk, if you've heard of them, they have some like milk booster supplements that have some of these herbs in there, like the brewer's yeast and the flaxine, all of that. So I'll recommend those to moms to take in conjunction with like, you know, the pumping and the nursing and all the things that we're doing to try to increase supply. Cause it's not, those are not going to hurt. All those you're going to do is help, mm -hmm. um, it makes you feel better to take them. Then that's great. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, there's, there's some other, there's medications that you can also take. I don't know if y'all have heard of like Dom Peridone before. Um, but that is a medication that can be prescribed 
to help increase milk supply. So that's something I won't even, I won't even get into the whole thing right now. It can be very, very hard to get. It's kind of like an under the table kind of thing because mm. of course, you know, here in the United States, they're, you know, things are, things are so whack. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, it almost sounds like you said Don Perion, like the alcohol. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's similar. It's similar. I'll have to text it to you. So that way you guys can look it up. Okay. Um, but it is, um, it's a medication that has been proven to help increase it, but you use it very short term mm-hmm. and there can be side effects with it, like with any medication. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I don't like to go the medication route, Um, so I've never personally recommended, um, you know, that medication or any others Mm -hmm. to clients because I, I get scared of the side effects. Mm -hmm, I don't know what kind of side effects it's going to have on a client. And I would rather try and do everything naturally. Yeah. Get the good latch. Right. (laughs) And then figure out the root cause of the problem. Um, then just loading somebody up on medications to try and increase milk supply and not really figuring out like the true issue. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. so that's kind of my take on that. It's definitely, uh, it's tricky situation. It differs for everybody. Sometimes, um, low milk supply can be like a thyroid related issue. Um, so I always, that's something that I'll ask clients if they're struggling with low milk supply, if they get their thyroid levels checked, um, if anything's out of balance, sometimes that can cause low milk supply. Um, any kind of like, um, hormonal imbalance. Mm. Like if you have PCOS or you struggle with infertility, those are all things I want to know for a consult because mm. any kind of like hormonal imbalance can cause low yeah. milk supply too. So it's interesting. Really so nice. maybe if you've had high estrogen, if your estrogen has been high, that could impact things too. So just making sure you're balancing yes. your diet. I'm sure diet yes. plays a huge role in making sure you're getting <laughs> enough protein, all that. So yeah, it's really like just kind of looking at the the whole mom and yeah, trying an individualistic to, approach. Yeah, yes. And looking at her whole history and trying to be like, okay, is there anything that's going on that could be contributing to the low milk supply? Like mm-hmm. let's, let's try and figure this out together. Um, mm-hmm. Because I think that that's just so important where, you know, you don't see that a lot of times nowadays where someone's actually taking the time to really get to like the root cause as to what is going on. Yeah. And I find, I just think it's so important. Like whenever I have a client and they fill out like the paperwork beforehand, they like the question, I have so many questions. It goes so in depth, <laughs> like um, yeah. where I really just like want to know like the full background of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, it comes down to like the birth too. Like mm-hmm. we were talking about before, like um, the cascade of interventions that can happen during labor and delivery. Um, all of that can contribute to a delay in your milk coming in Mm -hmm. and cause supply issues just right from the beginning. I -hmm. see so many moms that have had a C-section that told me, I asked when the first time they latched their baby and they said, I wasn't even able to see my baby until six hours later. Mm -hmm. And I mean, my heart just breaks for them because Mm -hmm. they should latch within that first hour. Mm -hmm. That's, that golden hour. And, you know, I feel like if hospitals and everything did a a better job at knowing the importance of that and allowing moms to have that experience, knowing like, this is going to be really beneficial to try and latch our baby in that first hour and have that skin to skin, um, because it can really help milk production in the beginning, um, things like that. So there's so much that can, that can go into play. Yeah. Really That's is. awesome That's advice. And we have yeah. one last question for you, Sarah, okay. but before yeah. we go into the question, I just want to give a shout out to Mrs. Patel's because she makes an oatmeal cookie. That is delicious. I am not <laughs> sponsored by Mrs. Patel's, but Hey, if she wants to sponsor us, <laughs> I just remember eating those. They were really good. <laughs> I'm thinking about yeah. cookies now, you know, we're all pregnant here. <laughs> no, I want a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> so the last question is probably the yeah. most important one. We asked about repeat moms, but we yeah. want to th- so throw something out for there for the first time moms. What do they need to know before baby arrives? You mentioned your consultation, which I definitely yeah. think they should do 
but what's your top tip or advice for a first time mom going into her breastfeeding journey? My top tip would probably be to give yourself grace going into it and go into it knowing that you are not a failure for how you ultimately decide how to feed your baby. Um, Mental health is so, so important. And I never want a mom to feel like they have to breastfeed, where sometimes there's that aura in the air where moms will just feel guilty, like they, they have to breastfeed. And if moms go into this journey and they, you know, just ultimately decide that they want to combo feed or they want to do formula feeding, I want moms to know that IBCLCs are still there to support them no matter how they choose to feed their baby. So, you know, we're trained in breastfeeding, obviously, but I, we also know how to Um, help moms with combo feeding. And we also know how to help moms with formula feeding and bottle feeding and all of that. And so really just kind of going into it, knowing like, all right, I've got this because no matter how I'm going to be choosing to feed my baby, I know I'm going to have support. Mm -hmm. And you hear those like slogans tossed around like breast is best, fed is best and all of that. And they just make me cringe because (laughs) I don't like any of them. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I think the slogan should be support is best. Yes. Yes. Because all moms need support when it comes to feeding. It doesn't matter how you are feeding, but I just, I think all moms should go into this journey knowing that support is best. I don't care how you're feeding your baby, but get somebody who can support you Mm -hmm. and have that lined up before you have your baby, you know, find your support team beforehand, have your support team on standby when your baby's born and just have have them in your court and I think that is probably like my my best advice that I can give for moms and you know I could I could say like oh make sure that new moms know how to do such and such latch and have you know um (laughs) and look for these poopy diapers and pee diapers on such and such days but I think when it comes down to it it's the support. It yeah. really is. That's what's lacking. And that's what needs to change. And all moms need to have access to a lactation professional who can help them in their feeding journey. And I think, I think that's, what's the important part. I totally agree. That right. was fantastic yeah. advice. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Now for those of you wondering, if you need to reach Sarah, cause something you, you, we're going to need to reach Sarah. Her website <laughs> is for the love of lactation.com. And she's on Instagram for the love of lactation underscore hit her up. She's happy to help you out. And Sarah, thank you so much for being yes, with you. us. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Yes, definitely. Great. Great information that lots and lots of ladies are going to benefit from moving forward. And thank you all for tuning in and for being on this journey with us. As always, if you'd like to follow along outside the podcast, join the mission on Instagram or Facebook at The Radiant Mission or on YouTube. Also want to throw a reminder because I forget to jump on our website and subscribe to our email list so you can get emails and get links to the show notes, which will have Sarah's information in it. So be sure to sign up for our emails. And then Rachel, you want to close us out again today? Yes. Yeah. I believe this is Sarah's favorite verse that Rebecca asked for. And this is also what I read at your wedding, Rebecca. So this is first Corinthians 13. (laughs) If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. 
love is patient love is kind it does not envy it does not boast it is not proud it does not dishonor others it is not self-seeking it is not easily angered it keeps no record of wrongs love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth it always protects always trusts always hopes always perseveres love never fails but where there are prophecies they will cease where there are tongues they will be stilled where there is knowledge it will pass away for we know in part and we prophesy in part but when completeness comes what is in part disappears when i was a child i talked like a child i thought like a child i reasoned like a child when i became a man i put away the ways of childhood behind me for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror then we shall see face to face now i know in part then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And we're wishing you a radiant week. Bye, guys!